You can think of our atmosphere as a protective blanket that shields us from the cold voids of space. Obviously, it's made up of the air we breathe in, so life as we know it would not be possible without it. But it also protects us from deadly cosmic radiation and helps burn away most of the meteors that would otherwise impact the surface pretty much every day. This atmosphere is the product of 4.7 billion years of evolution that's been shaped by everything that went on around and under it. So today, we'll give credit where credit is due and explore the fascinating atmosphere of Earth. Hello and welcome to 7 Facts. The history of Earth begins with the Hadean Eon. And it was a long, long time ago. It began 4.5 billion years ago with the formation of Earth and ended 500 million years later. To give you a clue of what it was like back then, this eon got its name from Hades, the Greek god of the underworld and the underworld itself. It was literally the eon of hell. Nowadays we are used to our air containing about 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen and 1% traces of other elements. But back then it looked very different. This primordial world was ravaged by impacts, giant volcanoes, radioactive elements and heat. Lots and lots of heat. The atmosphere around this planet was mostly hydrogen based. But precisely due to these hellish conditions, the constant outgassing gradually replaced hydrogen with nitrogen and carbon dioxide. This wasn't much better, but it was the beginning of something. This atmosphere lasted for a very long time with only minor changes. It was the atmosphere in which life formed and flourished on Earth. That is, until 2.4 billion years ago, when something changed in our biosphere. Something that would drastically alter the air. You see, up until this point, there wasn't any oxygen around. Most oxygen atoms were trapped underwater, where they binded with metals, specifically iron, and created rust, thus preventing even a little oxygenation of the atmosphere. But then, the cyanobacteria, commonly known as green algae, made an appearance. They've unlocked the secret of photosynthesis, a process in which free oxygen is released by living organisms. This new type of bioenergy production was wildly successful and cyanobacteria spread around the entire world, causing what is known as the Great Oxygenation Event. This event also represents the first mass extinction on Earth, because oxygen is actually toxic for anaerobic life forms, so most of them were simply poisoned to death. For us though, this is great news, because it's this air that allowed our oxygen-loving ancestors to evolve, and the atmosphere we still have today looks roughly like the one formed by our lovely green algae. By the way, most of the oxygen we have in the air today is still produced by those same cyanobacteria, not by trees or other plant life. That doesn't mean though that trees don't matter, not by a long shot. 419 million years ago, at the dawn of the Devonian period, life started colonizing the land. Huge forests rapidly spread around the world and at this time oxygen levels skyrocketed to about 32.5%. Thanks to this abundance of oxygen, many animals, especially insects, grew to ridiculously large sizes. But this also meant that wildfires occurred a lot more often and were much more violent than today. Oh and the sky, it wasn't blue. This high oxygen content actually gave the sky a pinkish color. Possibly the biggest threat mankind has ever faced has to do with our atmosphere. Yes, I'm talking about global warming, plain and simple. The problem is that since the Industrial Revolution, we've increased the amount of carbon dioxide by about 60% and methane by about 150%. But that's still not a lot. Currently, CO2 is at around 400 parts per million, which means that out of every 1 million molecules in the atmosphere, 400 of them are CO2 molecules. 
However, carbon dioxide is extremely good at handling thermal energy, so 400 parts per million are more than enough to increase temperatures on the entire globe. Nevertheless, the current climate change we are causing isn't the biggest that's ever been. During the Cambrian period, 541 million years ago, when complex life, including animals, appeared on Earth, greenhouse gases were at a much higher level. At the time, CO2 levels were 11 times higher than today. The average global temperature was 7 degrees higher than it is today. There was no ice at the poles, sea levels were much higher, and summers were a lot hotter. It literally took hundreds of millions of years to reabsorb that much CO2. At the time of the last dinosaurs, there was still five times more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than today. Now, keep in mind that 99% of the air we breathe in is nitrogen and oxygen. Only 1% is composed of trace elements, and CO2 is only a small 4% of that 1%. So this should give you an idea of just how astoundingly dynamic our atmosphere is. Before we continue, I'd like to ask you something. This channel has no sponsors, so if you enjoy the content I make, please consider supporting these videos by becoming a patron. You can check out my Patreon page by clicking here or find the link in the description. And with that out of the way, we can move on to the next fact. Let's talk a bit about the structure of our atmosphere. Yes, it's all air, but it's not the same everywhere. There are actually five layers that go from the surface of our planet all the way up to 10,000 kilometers. We are located in the troposphere, where most of our weather is formed. This layer extends to about the height of Mount Everest, up to 17 kilometers at the equator. It's the densest, wettest and warmest part of the atmosphere, where the vast majority of living things will be found. Next is the stratosphere, extending about 55 kilometers above the surface. Here, the pressure is roughly 1-1000, the pressure at sea level. It contains the ozone layer, which is really good at absorbing UV radiation. Because of this, temperatures around here hover around 0 degrees Celsius, much higher than the minus 60 degrees found atop the troposphere. The next layer is the mesosphere. It extends to about 85 kilometers above sea level and is the coldest place on Earth. Temperatures here are usually at minus 85 degrees. It's in this area that most meteors burn up due to friction. It's also a place inaccessible by aircraft or balloons, so only rockets ever transit the mesosphere. Above the mesosphere is the thermosphere, with an altitude range between 500 and 1000 km, depending on the strength of the solar wind. This part contains the ionized particles of our air, so auroras are usually initiated from here. It's also the starting point of Earth's magnetic shield, so it plays a vital role in the propagation of radio signals around the globe. The ISS also orbits the Earth in this layer. Temperatures in the thermosphere can get very high, up to 1500 degrees. But this is a tricky concept. Temperatures measure the kinetic energy of a system, basically how much particles jiggle, bounce and collide with each other. But the air density in the thermosphere is so low that one individual molecule can travel one entire kilometer before it collides with another molecule. Hence, the kinetic energy is high, so technically the temperature is high. But you wouldn't really feel it, because very few molecules would actually collide with your skin. Finally, we arrive at the last layer of Earth's atmosphere, the exosphere. This ranges from an altitude of 700 km all the way up to 10,000 km, where it practically merges into the solar wind. Atoms and molecules are so far apart in the exosphere that they can travel hundreds of kilometers without colliding with one another. However, these particles are still bound to Earth's gravity, which is the reason why it's considered to be a part of the atmosphere. This is where most of our satellites orbit the planet. While the content of our atmosphere is very important, it's not the only part that plays a role in our existence. 
air pressure is just as important. All terrestrial life has adapted to an air pressure equal to about one atmosphere, which is the pressure found at sea level. What this means is that air pushes on you from all sides, keeping you neatly packed up. With me so far? No? Well, maybe this'll help. If we measure the weight of a column of air with an area of one square centimeter from sea level all the way to the highest point of the exosphere, we get a mass of around 1.03 kilograms. That's the weight that pushes on you from every direction per every square centimeter. Okay, so what? Well, as we all know, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, right? Eh, kinda. That temperature is valid only at sea level. But as you increase your altitude, air gets thinner, so it becomes lighter, which means that there's less pressure pushing from all directions. The direct consequence of this is that the molecules of all fluids, including water, blood or saliva, are more loosely packed. In other words, the fluid will start to boil. At the top of Mount Everest, for instance, water boils at 72 degrees Celsius. Go even higher and you reach the Armstrong limit. Here, 18 kilometers above sea level, the pressure is so low that all fluids get so loosely packed that they start to boil at 37 degrees Celsius. Yep, that is the normal temperature of a human body, so if you find yourself at this altitude without a protective suit, your blood and saliva will boil away at your regular body temperature. Oh yeah, this is also the reason why liquid water can flow on the surface of Mars. The pressure is so low that water molecules just fly apart and turn into a gas. Here's a fun fact I just have to mention. The sky isn't blue, it's violet. Okay, let me explain. The reason our sky has any color at all is due to a phenomenon called the Rayleigh scattering. In short, our sun emits light of all wavelengths, including the ones invisible to our eyes. When light reaches our atmosphere, the colors with the shortest wavelength, like blue or violet light, get absorbed by the molecules in our atmosphere and are then re-emitted, scattering them in all directions. This scattering overshadows longer wavelength light, like red or orange, and thus we see a primarily blue sky. But here's the thing. Violet light has the shortest wavelength in the visible spectrum, so it is the light most scattered by our atmosphere. So why then do we see a blue sky? Because of our physiology. Our human eyes do a much better job in detecting blue light than violet. Pretty neat, huh? Lastly, let's talk about one of the most important substances found on Earth, including the atmosphere. Water. This is truly the most vital part of life on Earth. As far as we know, no living creature on our planet can survive without water. So we are quite fortunate that this substance is so abundant here. Not only that, but we are at just the right distance from the Sun for water to exist in all three states, solid, liquid and gas. That's also thanks to our atmosphere, which keeps temperatures at just the right level, and the air pressure, which allows all three states to exist in abundance. But there's also another part of this equation, the water cycle. Our atmosphere distributes water in the form of clouds, rain, snow, dew, or simply water vapor all around the world. Wanna know how much water lingers in the air? about 150 trillion liters at any one time. That's enough to cover the entire planet with 2.5 centimeters of rainwater. It might sound like a lot, but that's actually a drop in the ocean. No, really, water vapor in the atmosphere accounts for only 0.001% of all the water on Earth. I hope this video was interesting enough to have inspired you to look into it further on your own. If you liked it, leave a like and subscribe. You can leave your comments downstairs and you can also check out my Patreon page if you want to support me. The link is in the description. I hope to see you next time. Bye.